play and call it work. Hey everybody, Matthew here from MiniWargaming.com and welcome to the next episode of How to Play Age of Sigmar 2nd Edition. Today, we're going to talk about the shooting phase. As always, make sure that you subscribe and click the little bell icon to be notified when we put up new videos, especially for this series. And also, if you want others to learn how to play Age of Sigmar and you don't want to have to teach them, tell them to go to MiniWargaming.com slash how to play AOS as an Age of Sigmar and I'll teach them for you. And after this video is over, make sure to click the link in the video description below to go and watch the battle report, which we'll make sure is chock full of shooting so you can see all the principles and things that I'm going to demonstrate in this video put into action in a full game. And as usual, I've instructed the people making the video to make sure that they describe everything they're doing, spend more time on the rules than they normally would in a battle report, so that beginners are able to watch it follow along and be able to parse everything that's happening and understand what's going on. So that'll be the link description below. It's in the Mini Wargaming Vault, which is our paid subscription site that supports us and allows us to run this business. If you're not a Vault member, click it. We'll give you a free seven day trial to try it out and see if you like it as well. So now let's talk about the shooting phase. Now shooting and close combat work almost identically to each other, but we're still gonna break them up into two videos so you can see the little nuances. It also means they're gonna be repeating a bit of the same information about how to hit, how to wound, how saving throws work, but I think it's important that they're included in both videos for sake of completeness so you can see it in context because there is slight differences to it. In the shooting phase, you can have every unit that is equipped with missile weapons fire those at an enemy unit and they can split it however they want. So if the, for example, these five judicators on the left, they each have one shot. So we could split their shots into different units, put three of them into the Knight of Shrouds and two of them into the Chain Rasp Hordes. If we do that, we have to declare before we start shooting all that they're going to be doing and then we roll them all together. So you can't just say, well, this guy's going to fire first and then this one and then this one, and then this one, and then this one. You need to be more specific and declare it beforehand. So you first off, you select a unit who has missile weapons to shoot them. If there is an enemy unit within three inches of that unit, these judicators, for example, they can still fire, but they can only fire at an enemy unit that's within three inches of them, such as the Knight of Shrouds. So you can lock down certain shooting units by putting other units that maybe they wouldn't have wanted to shoot at instead. Other than that, they're free to fire at anybody within range. For example, as we take a look at the data card or the war scroll for the Judicators, you can see that their Skybolt bow, which is what they are currently equipped with, has a range of 24 inches. That means that each model that is in range is allowed to fire. Now this is an important distinction between normal things like how far a unit is away from another unit that we actually look at each model individually. So if this model at the back was more than 24 inches away from the target, it wouldn't be able to fire. So we'd only roll the dice for the models in range. Now, of course, if he's within 24 inches of another target, he's free to declare that unit as the target before dice start rolling. The next part on the profile in the War Scrolls card is the number of attacks. This is how many dice we are going to roll. In the case of Skybolt bows, they have one attack apiece. And so then what we would do is we would roll five dice in total because there are five Judicators, each with one attack, and we roll five dice. Now, we're going to go through the attacking sequence right now, even though it is the same sequence that happens in the combat phase, because it's important for you to understand. So having it show up twice in this tutorial series is actually really important. So making attacks goes in four steps. Hitting, wounding, saving, and damaging. It's important to differentiate between these things as certain rules will interact with these rules at different points. The first thing that we have to do is our hit roll. Now we look at the two hit profile on the war scroll to find out what it is that we need to roll. So remember we're rolling five dice and the to hit roll on the judicators is a five plus. Now the judicator prime that's in here he gets to add one of the hit rolls, but we're gonna ignore that right now. So anybody watching this thinking, hey, you forgot that, I didn't forget it, we're just not gonna look at that quite yet. So we're just gonna treat these as five regular Judicators. So we roll our five dice, we'll do that right here. 
And we got really lucky. Every single roll was three or higher. So all five hit. Let's say that only four of them. Let's say this one was a two though. Then what we'd do is we would remove that one and we've got four hits. And no matter what modifiers you have, a one is always a failure. So if you had a spell on them that gave them plus one to hit, and they had an ability that when firing at night haunt, they get another plus one to hit. Well, technically a three plus, if you roll a die, no matter what you roll is going to be a three plus if I get plus two. But an unmodified die roll of one always misses. And on the opposite end, if there are negatives to hit, and it would bring it above six. So for example, if let's say Judicators only hit on a six plus, they had a two hit of six plus, and something was giving them minus one to hit. Well, it would be impossible to get a six or higher on one die when you're subtracting one from it. But a to hit roll of six before modifiers always hits the target. So ones always miss, sixes always hit. So we've got four hits right here. The next step is wounding. We do our wound roll. This works exactly the same as a hit roll, except instead of looking at the two hit part on the war scroll here, we look at the two wound. It doesn't matter what you're firing at, your two wound is dependent on the weapon you are firing. In the case of the Judicators, it's three plus. So we're gonna roll these dice, and we got one, two, four, and four. Well, there's no modifiers here, so the two fours are successful, and the one and the two are not. Now, just like hit rolls, a, an unmodified roll of one, always fails, and an unmodified roll of six always wounds. So it's impossible to make it so a unit can't try to fire their weapons, no matter how many negative modifiers you put on them. And it's also impossible to make them always hit with their weapons. The next thing that happens is called a save roll. And this is done by the opponent, the person who controls the target. This is the chance that they have to ignore the damage of the weapon. Now in the case of Chain Rasp Hordes, on their War Scroll you can see that they have a save of 5+. plus. What that would mean is that they have to roll each wound that was inflicted to them, and every 5+, plus they would ignore the damage. So we rolled a 4 and a 5, so the 5 ignores the damage and the 4 doesn't. However, some weapons have what's called a rend. So when you look at the War Scroll of the Skybolt Bull for the Judicators, you notice they have a rend of minus 1. That rend is applied to the die roll of the enemy's save. So in this case, the five plus wouldn't be enough because we have minus one from that becomes a four and it's no longer a five plus and that would go through. Now, this is a bit of a special case because Chain Rasp Hordes and All Night Haunt have a special rule that they can never have their save modified either positively or negatively because they're ethereal. So these Chain Rasp Hordes would ignore the minus one. But let's just forget that rule for a second and let's pretend that the Chain Rasp Hordes just have a normal save of five plus. In this case, both of those dice would have failed. The last step is to determine damage. Each successful attack inflicts damage. In this case, we've got two successful attacks have inflicted damage. We look at the damage profile of the weapon to see how much damage. In the case of Skybolt bows and most weapons, the damage is one. So each of these does one damage, which inflicts that many wounds to the unit. Lastly, we allocate those wounds, that damage, to the unit. The controlling player gets to decide where it's allocated. In other words, the player who has the chain rasp pores, not the, not the player who's firing at them, but the player who owns them, can choose which models to remove. Chain rasp pores, as you can see in their war scroll, only have one wound apiece, so two damage would kill two of them. If the damage of the Judicator's bows was two, for example, then this would inflict four damage, in other words, it would kill four of the chain rasp hordes. I can remove the chain rasp hordes from wherever I like, from the front to make it harder to charge, from the back to keep me nice and close, somewhere in the middle. I don't have to kill special characters till the end. If there's a standard bear, I can hold on to him. I can allocate it to a model who has a special rule to ignore wounds. I can do however I like. But remember, if at the end of the turn, let's say I killed these three models right here, when we look at these chain rasp hordes, now all of a sudden, they're not all within an inch of each other. So at the end of the turn, the player who controls the chain rasp hordes is gonna have to kill more models until they're all within an inch of each other. So it's usually a good idea to remove them from the outskirts of a unit rather than from the middle of a unit. So just choose carefully as you decide how to allocate that damage. Another thing to consider when firing at a unit is cover. 
Cover is uh, defined based on the pieces of terrain, but for example, this wall provides cover to this unit because they're all within an inch of it, and the wall is closer to the judicators than the chain rasp horde. And cover is really simple. It gives a plus one modifier to the saving throw of the unit that is being fired at. Now, once again, the chain rasp hordes don't care about cover because they ignore modifiers, positive or negative. Forget that for a second if you know that rule and just treat them like they don't have that. So here, if the judicators were to fire and deal damage, let's say we go back to that two damage again. Well, now the chain rasp horde needs to roll five or higher, but the rend of the judicator skybolt bow is minus one, so they, really they have to roll six or higher, but then the cover gives them a plus one, in essence negating the negative one rend. And if there was no rend, even bringing their save to a four plus. So now, if they had cover, that five would have actually successfully saved and they would have only lost one of their models. Note that cover usually requires the entire unit to have cover in order for it to benefit them. Characters, such as this Knight of Shrouds, have a special rule to keep them protected. All heroes, so anything with the hero keyword, usually all your leaders, have a rule called Lookout Sir. Lookout Sir is to represent they're a little harder to hit when they're amongst all of their followers. It works as follows, that if they are within three inches of one of their own units that has at least three or more models, the Judicators, or whoever's firing at them, have a minus one to their hit rolls. So they're a little harder to hit. It doesn't matter if the Knight of Shrouds was closer to the Judicators or further away from the Judicators, he'll still have that minus one to hit. One exception to this rule is if the hero is also a monster, they're just too big to have little guys around them slowing down the shooters. Some weapons have special rules that allow them to hit more than once when they roll a hit. That might sound confusing at first, so let me just give you an example. Right here, this Judicator Prime is armed with a Shock Bolt Bow. Now a Shock Bolt Bow is special in that whenever it scores a hit, it inflicts D6 hits instead of one. What that means is when I roll a hit, and I roll a four, and I successfully hit, then I actually roll a D6, in this case a four, and that's how many dice I get to roll to wound for that weapon. So all of a sudden he's rolling threes to wound, and you can see that now it's inflicted three wounds that must be saved by the Night Haunt player. So anytime that they do that, there's some weapons that'll say for every hit there's two hits, or D3 hits, or D6 hits. It's going to multiply before you start rolling your wound rolls. Lastly, there is the matter of mortal wounds. Mortal wounds are a special kind of wound, often inflicted by spells, or certain powerful weapons will inflict mortal wounds if they roll high enough, or there's a lot of different ways that mortal wounds can be inflicted. Mortal wounds are different than regular wounds in that they totally ignore most of the stats. They don't roll the hit, they don't roll the wound, typically, they don't roll a saving throw, they just go straight to damage. So they just ignore all your saves whatsoever. For example, let's say, and they don't, but let's say that the Judicators had a rule that whenever they roll a six to hit, unmodified, so if you just roll this really quick, and let's say this one was a six, and this one was a six, that they inflict a mortal wound instead of their regular damage, then we would stop right there with those two sixes. We wouldn't roll the wound, and we wouldn't roll a save, we would just go straight to inflicting damage. And that just goes through everything. So mortal wounds are very common. You're gonna come across them all the time, especially against wizards, but really, you're gonna see them in all sorts of situations, so just be prepared for that. They just ignore the whole process. Sometimes they don't even have to roll the hit. Arcane Bolt as a spell, for example. If successfully cast, you select a unit within 18 inches and it inflicts one mortal wound. If you roll high enough, it does D3 mortal wounds. That just goes through everything. The only exception to that is there's a lot of rules out there that say whenever a wound or mortal wound is allocated to a unit, you can roll a die, and if you roll six or higher, or five or higher, or sometimes the really powerful ones, four or higher, they ignore that wound. That one can ignore mortal wounds as well, if it specifies that. If the shooting unit has different profiles for each model, for example, the Judicator Prime in here, what we said before that we were ignoring, let's talk about now, he has a special rule that he gets to add one to hit rolls, and he has the sky bolt or the shock bolt bow, which does d6 hits. You need to roll separately for him. You can't roll at the same time. 
And so let's do the other four first. Let's say the other four rolled and, well, they got four hits. They need to roll three or higher. And then they need to roll three or higher for their wounds. Oh, geez, I'm rolling really well here. That's four wounds. These guys then have to roll five or higher, but they get minus one to it. We're going to ignore their rule of ethereal. And so that five is ignored because of the rend. So they would take one damage. Well, before we allocate that wound, we actually then have to resolve the damage, or sorry, three damage, not one, because they failed three, they made one. We would have to resolve the attack from the Judicator Prime as well. He hits on a two instead of a three because he gets a plus one. It does D6 hits. That's three hits, which wound on threes. Wow, I'm rolling really well here. They ignore it on sixes because it's minus one from the five. So two of those get through. So we've got five damage in total. Then we allocate that damage to the Chain Rasp Hordes. Now, usually players will just allocate it as it happens and just remember that, yeah, he was in range. For example, the Judicator Prime, maybe he was just barely in range of the unit just from the front one. And so you're like, well, the first guy to die is him. Now the Judicator Prime's no longer in range. You can't do that because all those shots are assumed to come simultaneous. So any rules that apply, keep applying until all that shooting from that one unit is done. Then you allocate all the wounds technically just for ease of play though, people usually allocate them as they happen. And then you remove all the models. One last thing that I should just point out, some abilities allow you to heal models, and that is that you can restore wounds allocated to them, but that cannot be done to a model that is slain. So for example, this Knight of Shrouds, if he is wounded, let's say that he takes three wounds. Well, three wounds is not enough to kill him, as you can see on his profile right here. So we're gonna count up. We're going to mark down right beside him. I like to use a D12 or a small D6 just to show how it's different. And so I will mark that he's taken three wounds. Let's say that we have lost two of the Chain Rasp hordes right here. Now, if I get to heal one wound to all the Night Haunt, like every unit of Night Haunt get to heal one wound, well, then he would heal one. So he'd go down to two. But I wouldn't get to bring back one of the Chain Rasp hordes because that's not how healing works. Unless the spell or ability that allows you to do this specifically says, if they don't have any wounds allocated to them, then you can bring back a model. But if it just says that it heals them, that means removing wounds that have been allocated to them. And of course, this Knight, Sh Knight of Shrouds will not be removed until he has received a number of wounds equal to his wounds characteristic, as you can see on his War Scroll right here. Meaning that he'll last longer and is harder to kill. One other nuance that will come up, and that is not allowed to be done, is people maybe will try to allocate wounds to more than one model. For example, these Judicators, as you can see on their War Scroll card, have two wounds apiece. Let's say somebody fired at them or hit them in close combat and inflicted one wound. Well, since they have two wounds, it's not going to kill a Judicator, so I'm going to inflict one of the wounds to this Judicator right here. Let's say that another attack from another shooting attack or close combat and then inflicts another wound to this unit and they fail to save and all of that. When we go to allocate it, I can't just say, well, I'm gonna allocate a wound to this model. You have to continue allocating wounds to the same model until it dies. This is actually a really good thing for the game, even though it means your guys die faster, because it gets really, really annoying when you start to see one wound token there, and then one wound token there, and then one on him, one on him, one on him, and they start to die. You have all these little wound tokens everywhere, and it makes units a little too survivable. So remember, once you start allocating wounds to a model in the unit, you must continue allocating wounds to that model until it is dead. So choose wisely where you start allocating wounds. And that's the shooting phase. Not much more complicated than that. I know we talked about a lot of little things, lookout sirs, shooting at enemies that are close to you, further away, resolving all these extra things. Most shooting you'll find is actually relatively simple. You just roll to hit, roll to wound, saving throws, and you're done. And if that sounds daunting, that'll become super easy and super intuitive because that's the core mechanic of how you attack somebody else. In fact, in our next video, we're gonna be talking about both the charge phase and the combat phase. And the combat phase is gonna repeat a lot of what you just learned here. So you'll be able to hear it again. On top of that, we've got a battle report for you where both armies are gonna have lots of shooting. So you get to see all of the different ways that it might occur and see how it interacts in the actual game. So make sure you click the link below to go and watch that right now. If you're not a mini Wargaming Vault member, which is where it is located, you can sign up for a free seven day trial by clicking that link as well. And we hope that you, of course, you will end up being a Vault member and supporting us to help us to make more videos like this. And as always, if you want somebody else to learn how to play Age of Sigmar and you don't want to have to teach them, 
Tell them to go to miniwargaming.com slash how to play AOS as an Age of Sigmar. I will see you in the next video. Happy working.